Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Plutonium Bunny. In today's episode, I will be making an aluminum bell starting from this pink housing insulation foam. To begin, I cut four squares out of the foam about the same size so that they could stack on top of each other, just like this. It is important here to make sure that the faces of each square are perfectly flat and planar so that they have intimate contact with each other in the gluing step. If insufficient care is taken to make a flat face, only portions of the face will contact each other and the glue will actually not hold them together very well, necessitating a redoing of the gluing step. Here I'm just using normal Elmer's glue for interior, exterior, wood gluing purposes, uh, but I glued all four of them together and then set a board on top with a large bucket of lead weights. The whole setup was allowed to sit overnight with the bucket of lead bullets on top, after which point a hole was drilled all the way through using a large drill bit. The setup had to be rotated once and then carefully aligned and drilled from the other side because the drill bit was not long enough for a single pass. Afterward, a large square billet was obtained and the excess corners of this were cut off. This will reduce the forces that the billet experiences when it is glued to a dowel rod through the hole in the center and chucked up in the drill press because in the next step the corners will be taken off and it will be made perfectly round using a metal rasp. This was repeated for all the four corners after which point the billet was placed with the dowel rod in the drill press so that it looked about like this. A large toothed metal rasp was then used to smooth down the edges and just kind of make the entire thing perfectly circular. At this point I did not start the tapering process because I wanted to get the final diameter nailed down and this really wasn't very planned out. It was just the diameter at which point it became a perfect circle. Kind of fun to watch the chips fly off. At this point a good vacuum can be useful. The really daunting task in this project came when I had to turn the round billet into an actual bell shape and make it look really aesthetically pleasing. I was initially pretty afraid that my artistic skills were going to be lacking, being a scientist engineer type after all, but things turned out fine in the end so I think that's not too much of a concern. The key is here to go really slow on the taking off end of things because it's easier to take off more foam than it is to add more foam. So I kept going at it for a while with the rasp. Never really changed tools because this was just the really rough work and things would get sanded later. Uh, but pink foam went everywhere. After a while I was left with a shape that looked like this. You can see there's kind of a block of foam left on the top. That will get cut off later, but for now it's useful as it provides more support to the piece. So I started sanding this, starting with some rougher sandpaper and working my way up to about 220 grit. It's not really useful to go much finer than that because at that point it'll just clog the sandpaper and not really do much to the foam. And this is all going to be sand cast anyway, so that won't really preserve all that much detail. But the goal here is just to make it not super rough and to remove the marks from the rasp. In this still image, you can see how the whole setup looked on its dowel rod stick. Kind of like a state fair food if you're from Minnesota. Something on a stick. So a really challenging part of this project came when I had to carve out the inside of the bell. I initially tried using a rasp, but that was just going nowhere. So what I ended up doing was hooking a variac up to a wooden rod with some wires and then used some bolts on the end to clamp in place a small piece of nichrome wire out of an old hot plate. And then I adjusted the variac until this wire just barely glowed. And this provided a really easy carving tool to do some really large scale carving work on the piece. And then what I did was I finished this off with sandpaper. And I would recommend going almost as thin as you dare here because it'll end up being thicker in the casting and thick bells don't have as good of a sound as thinner ones do. So after this was complete I used a saw to cut off that bulky piece of foam on the bottom because now all the hard work on the bell has been done and from now on there shouldn't be too much stress placed on the bell. 
And, yep, I goofed. So I was a little bit too excited with the hot wire cutter and totally tore through the wall of this bell. So that's a little bit annoying, but that is what this pink modeling clay is for. So I used some of this clay to fill in both the large defects and the small ones and just generally make things a little bit of a smoother job on the inside of the bell. The outside was fine with the exception of the places where I tore through. In the end, I was left with a bell that looked like this and then I used some of this masking tape to just cover the entire outside as well as the inside. What this does is both protect the clay from getting sand on it, which would then stick to the sand. And it also just generally makes the bell a little bit more non-stick and less porous. And this will be helpful in the casting process to prevent sand from sticking and enable a clean release. In the end it looked like this, kind of like some sort of weird hat, I would imagine. So I took the finished bell and then began to fill it with sand first using my trusty talcum powder sock to dust things a little bit to provide more of that non-stick action. This clay uh, sand mixture is my green sand. It's just some powdered cat litter clay mixed with sand and then enough water to make it so it sticks into a ball when you crunch it in your fist, but is not super sticky. So I overturned the bell once it was filled and then put it in this casting flask and filled that flask with more sand and cut a sprue to complete the flask just like this. Ah, uh, nothing more satisfying than aluminum box tube sliding into the fiery abyss. I set up my furnace for casting, fueled it with charcoal and started the forced air and set in the crucible and filled that up as full as it could possibly go with aluminum from scrap aluminum box tube. I really wasn't sure how much the casting would take and honestly I was pretty afraid that I would not have enough aluminum. So I am very thankful that it all worked out in the end and was able to fill the casting. Anyhow, the process of pouring was fairly straightforward and just like my other videos, uh, degassing with sodium carbonate and fluxing with sodium chloride after the crucible, which was a cut-off propane tank this time for larger volume, was full of aluminum. Uh, the correct pouring temperature is usually about three minutes after the last piece has been molten, so I let it heat up that long. It goes without saying that proper safety equipment is a must at this point, for reasons that will become very apparent quite shortly. When all the dross was skimmed off, I was ready to pour, so I took it out and began to pour, and I thought things would go well at this point. The aluminum went in very well. I thought it would have enough aluminum. And bubbles! Ah, uh. Yeah, things went south pretty fast at this point, and I was basically certain that the casting had failed completely and would be ridden with bubbles. If it had been any more explosive, there would have been molten aluminum all over me. Ah, the look of failure. Anyhow, after things cooled down a little bit, I very cautiously opened the mold, not sure what I would find. To my extreme shock, it looked like the casting had actually worked, at least in some regards. The very base of the bell, the rim, was actually all intact, and that gave me a lot of hope. So I continued to remove the sand, and eventually, I was actually, shockingly, left with a bell shape. What? The bell looked like it had really worked pretty well, all things considered, and I, at this point, could not see any bubbles. It was still pretty rough, and I think that's a product of the grain of casting sand I'm using. I should use finer sand. I started the finishing process by cutting off the sprue, and at this point I realized where the bubbles had hidden themselves. Right here we have a nice big bubble occupying most of the sprue. So I think what happened here is that the inner core 
for the inside of the bell was slightly moist, and that created steam, which made the bubbles. I began the rest of the finishing process by taking off this flashing, and after that I was ready to drill a hole and put in a bolt. And this was really key for the rest of finishing and for keeping things concentric, because I didn't have a fancy lathe, and I'm pretty sure you wouldn't finish a bell on a lathe anyway. So I tightened the bolt really tight so that nothing would come off um, when I chucked this up on the drill press. These are just totally random bolts. I think it was a quarter twenty. Um, it's good to use a washer here, especially because this section had a bubble on it, so it's structurally weaker. I started it spinning at one of the lowest RPMs on the drill press and began to use a really rough setting of a metal rasp to take off the largest portions of roughness. This will create marks, but those can be dealt with later. It's key to not press too hard or else you could damage the bell or the drill press. I then used some rough sandpaper to take off the rasp marks, and this worked really well. I was very satisfied with the result. Finer sandpaper was then used to give the bell more of a shine, and here you don't have to worry as much about not pressing hard as long as you're still keeping in mind the drill press safety. And here's the finished product. It turned out really well, all things considered. Very shiny, pretty decent bell shape for having freehanded it, and no bubbles really to be seen. Success.